Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living, where we are currently studying the first epistle of Peter. Today we are picking up at verse 14 of the first chapter. In the prior verse, Peter was discussing how we should be prepared for the troubles, the trials, the persecutions, and the tribulations that are ahead by girding up the loins of our minds, and we discussed what that meant in the prior discussion. That we basically prepare our minds by keeping the right perspective, which is that we are inheriting a very great, a very big inheritance from God, right? A very big inheritance from God, which we will receive at the revealing of Jesus Christ when he comes back to receive us. And having this in mind, everything else, including the suffering and trials in this world, should be made smaller in our minds and should no longer be our focus driving us to fear. You see, Peter gives this advice knowing that trials and persecution have and will come. And this letter is included for us in the Bible because the Lord intended that this letter is for us also in our time, especially our time as we are living in the last days, even the last hour, right? So Peter moves on to discuss in what condition our life should be when we gird the loins of our minds and fully set our hope upon the eternal life that Jesus is bringing with him to give us. So what condition should our life be? How should we be living while we wait? Well, let's see what Peter says because this is very, very, even critically important. Let's take a look and read verse 14 together. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. So the Apostle Peter says that while we are waiting eagerly, eagerly for the return of Jesus, we should be obedient as children right here. See that? We should be obedient as children while we wait for him. So, you know that Jesus said in the gospel that unless you be like little children, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And sure enough, the apostles of Jesus Christ here are teaching us the same thing. You know, we must be obedient, even obedient as children. Now, What's the difference about the obedience of children compared to other kinds of obedience? Well, children, when they are obedient, they rely on their parent knowing that their parent knows what's best for them. When we grow up, we begin to think that we know everything, you see, and that we no longer need to rely on our parents. And we tend to start having this behavior as if we know what's best for us in everything that we do. But with that kind of mentality, we forget that we have a Father in heaven to whom we must still be obedient. And we therefore become a little bit less likely to fully obey Him, right? God, right? The way that a child obeys a parent. You see, when we get older, it's as if we sort of inappropriately transfer this independence that we gain in the world to our relationship with God. But wait a minute. The Lord says, no, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are obedient like a child, with an innocent heart like a child. In fact, the child is not occupied with the lusts and the desires that the adult entangles themselves with. Isn't that right? And in fact, we see that Peter continues in verse 14 saying, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Right? Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. What does he mean? What does Peter mean here? Well, he says here, not conforming to your former lusts. Right? Now, when Peter says not conforming, 
right here, when Peter says not conforming, it means not shaping or fashioning ourselves, okay, or our lives in that old way that we used to live in, right? Not conforming, right? Not shaping ourselves and fashioning ourselves around it, okay? This implies that we are to shape or fashion our lives around a new way, right? And when he says not conforming to our former, the word former, okay, means that the way that you were before you were born again in the Spirit, okay? When he says former, he's referring to the way that you used to be before you were born again in the Spirit, right? And so the phrase then, former lusts, then means the sins that we indulged in before we were born again with the Holy Spirit of God. If you are now born again, a believer in Jesus Christ, having the Holy Spirit, then you can never go back. That's right, you can never go back. You cannot shape or fashion your life especially your new life, around that former way of living anymore. You cannot. Peter says this in a way that makes it clear that it starts with our mindset, right? Our mindset, our attitude. It has everything to do with what we do, how we set our minds and hearts about it, right? That's why he talked to us, talked to us previously about... Um, Right up here, right up here, girding up the loins of our mind, you see? Because it's a mindset, right? And we talked about all of this previously. So make sure if you haven't joined that discussion, uh, you really need to join that discussion first. And so it's true. It has everything to do with how we set our minds and our hearts about this, okay? Very important. You can't look back to that old life. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ, one who is to inherit a, a, a very heavenly, eternal thing, okay? And so God expects a total change in us. When he looks down at us, he sees that we are a new creation, a new creation. So he expects a new change, a total change within us because we're a new creation, one who has a great inheritance that is reserved for us in heaven, as the Bible says. Remember that? So, my friends, how can you become a child of the true God, a Christian, following Jesus Christ, and then go back to being a child of darkness? A child of darkness cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Sorry, not going to happen. Jesus made it clear. Peter makes it clear. The Apostle Paul makes it clear. The beloved Apostle John makes it clear. The whole Bible makes it clear. So you have no excuse. If you have believed in Jesus Christ and are born again with his spirit, but you returned to your sins the way that a dog returns to his own vomit, then you remember what we read back in Hebrews when we covered that. Remember that? Let's just take a quick peek at that in uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, okay? We're going to look here just very quickly at chapter 10. May, may, you may know exactly what we're talking about. Chapter 10, where we read the following. For if we sin willfully, meaning on purpose, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, that is the gospel, right? There then no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, meaning make holy, Right? Sanctified meaning to be made holy, set apart for God. Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. You see that? I mean, that's, that's something to, to be aware of. I mean, this is, 
This is a very critical thing. You see, you cannot, okay, trample. Let me highlight it for you here. You cannot trample the Son of God under your feet by going back to the very sins that required his blood to be shed for you in the first place and then expect some kind of reservation for you in his kingdom. You see, a lot of Christians are living with this very dangerous false mentality, thinking that simply having knowledge of Jesus, of who Jesus is, just having the knowledge of who he is, that that's enough without having any change inside of your heart. You know, it raises the question of whether they were even born again, having the Holy Spirit of God, those who are thinking this way. Now, remember, the five foolish virgins had knowledge of the bridegroom, didn't they? Remember the parable that the Lord gave of the ten foolish virgins? Five were, the, ten, the ten virgins, five were foolish, five were wise. The five foolish virgins, well, they had knowledge of a bridegroom, didn't they? And even that he was coming, huh? But did that knowledge grant them entrance into the kingdom of God? No. And that should make you stop and think and evaluate in your heart because Jesus is aware of what is in everyone's heart, not just what's in your mind. We have to put that stethoscope, listen to me now, we have to take that stethoscope, all right, and put it over our hearts, okay, not over our foreheads because that knowledge has to mix with the Word and the Spirit of God to produce a new heart, a heart of flesh, not a heart of stone, right? And therefore, the Lord is evaluating the heart. Now, many people today, okay, they're living today in a false sense of security. They're putting this stethoscope on their head, okay? But my friends, that is the wrong way to use it, okay? Put it over your heart because that is where Jesus is looking and evaluating, right? After all, the things in our head, okay, or on our minds will be influenced by what is in your heart, right? You know, God says that it is about the heart. And we are reminded in Hebrews again, in chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, we could take a look at that quickly, which quotes a message from the Psalms given from the Holy Spirit of God saying to us, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, just as they did long ago. You see, this, my friends, is a heart issue. And we can go down, and we can go down to verse 10 here, you see. And what does it say in verse 10? It says, Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. You see that? So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. See that? And so, my friends, that, by the way, is a very bad result, right? And finally, just look at verse 12 here where we read the following after the scripture was quoted, saying, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You see that? I think it's clear that there is a heart issue, right? A heart issue. Such that even faith itself has roots in the heart, you see, and not so much the brain. You know, that knowledge that we have in our head absolutely must be mixed together with a good desire toward God in our hearts, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, my friends, something we have to really consider. Now, don't live in that false sense of security, okay? People can go to church on Sunday, join their friends or, 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 or church friends on fun retreats, okay? They can go to church barbecues and at the same time have absolutely no changed heart, no relationship with Jesus, and no eagerness for his return. By the way, that is a false life, my friends. Don't let the Lord come back and find your heart unprepared, all right? You see... Let's take a step back for a moment here, all right, and just kind of evaluate this. You see, Peter is, yes, 
He's pouring out his heart in this letter with such wonderful reminders, okay, of the gift of our salvation, particularly at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's encouraging us to have this boldness in the face of troubles and persecutions. However, okay, however, make no mistake about it. Peter shifts gears here and he is saying here that he can only hold your hand but so far because the responsibility is on you. See, Peter is encouraging us, yes, and he's giving us hope, yes, and he's directing our minds and our hearts to be prepared for the Lord. But make no mistake about it. Peter here, in a way, is laying things out to be very clear. That is, all that he described so far from verse 1 until verse 13 is to our benefit and our edification so that we know the truth and are comforted by the truth. But here it's made very clear that all these truths, all these things are under the expectations that we be obedient as children, not going back to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Okay? And he says as in your ignorance to mean that before we believed in Jesus Christ and knew the truth, we were ignorant, right? Living according to the way of the world, which was false and promoted lifestyles that did not honor God. But that was a former thing, okay? A former thing of ignorance. Now, we can no longer claim ignorance because we now know the truth. And we can take a sneak peek, okay, to what Peter will tell us, by the way, in his second epistle. Let's just take a quick peek at that. Very important. In Peter's second epistle, okay, in chapter 2, 21 and 22, the Apostle Peter says this, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a so, having washed, to her wallowing in the mire, like a, like a pig going back after it's been cleaned, going back to jumping in the mud, right? So, there it is, okay? It would have been better not to have even known the way of truth than to know it and then turn away from it. You see that? Going back to the lusts of the flesh and denying his commandments. Because it is deemed far more offensive when you experience the goodness of the Lord, but decide that you don't like it and you prefer your old sinful ways. Then, when you were ignorant of the truth before you lived for Jesus Christ, you were deemed ignorant having not even met Jesus yet, but to meet him and then reject him after you meet him, well, that's just offensive. That's offensive. You see, that is counted as having accepted a marriage and then being unfaithful in that marriage. It would have been far less offensive if you would have not even been married in the first place. You understand? It does not mean that it is better to not know Jesus. No, that's ridiculous. That's not what's meant by this. You see, when you meet the one true God of the whole world, who saves your very soul and gives you eternal life when you come into a marriage with him, it is then very offensive to be unfaithful to him, right? Look to any marriage, okay? Look to any marriage around you, and you will see that this very thing is true. How much more than the marriage of the believer to God himself, right? Now let's look at verse 15 in our passage, where we read the following. He says the following, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Wow. He says, he who called you is holy. Just look at this. He who called you is holy. Meaning that God is the one who called you out of your former sinful life to give you new life. And this God who gives you new life, well, he is holy. 
So Peter is saying that if God who has called us to himself is holy, then we also should be holy in all of our conduct, in all of it. Not a little bit of our conduct, you see? Not a little bit of our conduct, see? Not some of our conduct, heck, not even most of our conduct, but all of our conduct, right? In fact, Peter quotes God himself, right? Describing in the very next verse, verse 16 here, which reads, Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. This command from God, Peter is quoting from the scriptures from the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, chapter 11. That, you know what? We should just even take a peek at that. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 through 45. Look at this. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth, for I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. You see? And this is very clear, my friends. God is holy, and he expects us to be holy in all of our conduct, just as Peter says right? Everything that we do. Everything that we do. Now, because Peter is writing to encourage believers in the New Testament by using scriptures from the Old Testament, then we can be confident that the expectations of God in the Old Testament have not changed. You see that? The things that God loved back then, he still loves now. The things that God hated in the Old Testament, he still hates today, especially sin. And so, it is the case that God has always expected those people who are called by his name to be holy. You know, I want you to think about this. When you believe in Jesus Christ, because your eyes are opened and you realize that the gospel is the truth, you then receive the Holy Spirit and you are born again, right? When we believe and we are born again, then we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus, right? We are sanctified by the blood of Jesus, by his word and by his spirit. And you can check the gospel according to John chapter 17, 17. You can check the epistle to the Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. You can check the first epistle to the Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. You can check the epistle of, uh, to the Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, and so much more. And we can take an example of that. Let's take a look. A little, uh, I have a little example of that. Hold on one second. Pull it up here. Now, if you look here, okay, we see that this is in Hebrews, all right? This is Hebrews uh, chapter 13, verse 12, and it says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Look at the word sanctify here. The word sanctify has a meaning. Greek word number 37, hagiazo, okay, hagiazo, which literally means to make holy, to purify, to consecrate, right? And consecrating is setting something apart to God, right? To set us aside for God as a holy people. That is actually what it even means to be sanctified, right? And so, keeping this very thing in mind, all right, keeping this very thing in mind, we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, when we believe in Jesus Christ and the gospel, we are literally being set aside as God's own people who are to be holy. You see, that is actually what it means, that his blood sanctifies us. In fact, if we take a quick peek at the word for holy, as it's used in our passage here, let me open that, hold on one second here. Then we see the Greek word hagios, which means basically the same thing, sacred, pure, morally blameless, consecrated to, be, to God, right? Being set apart, that's the same thing as being uh, sanctified, right? And it even says here, a saint, right? A saint. And 
you see, that is why the apostles, especially the apostle Paul, refers to all the people, all the people who are believers in the gospel as saints, even addressing them as the saints throughout his epistles. Just as you and I are saints of God if we believe in the gospel and are obedient to the gospel. And so the apostles want all the believers to know, they want them to know that they are the saints so that they would conduct themselves the way that saints of God should conduct themselves. You see, this is the same reason that churches today should be teaching Christians that they are the saints of God in order to encourage all of them, right? To encourage all of them to live in a holy manner with holy conduct, just as God himself is holy. And by the way, this Greek word, hagios here, is the same word that the Apostle Paul uses when he refers to those believers who are alive in the world, calling them saints. So we see the clear connection here. And with this new birth through his Holy Spirit, or we can even say this new life that we have, you now have this new nature, right? This new nature in which we are to live as a sanctified people, okay? And we even bear the name Christian. That, my friends, is no little title. You see, bearing the title of Christian is a huge honor. Now, we can even look, I want to show you something. In the book of Acts, okay, we read something very interesting in Acts chapter 11. Let me just show you this. In Acts chapter 11, we read, okay, Actually, let's look here at uh, verse 25 and 26 in the 11th chapter of Acts. We read, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You see that? And so we read that in the leadership of the great apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles and Barnabas, that the believers in Christ were first called Christians, right? Additionally, when the apostle Paul was being questioned by the Roman authorities uh, in chapter 26 of Acts, let's just take a quick look at that. Um, we see here in verse 27 through 29, that the apostle Paul says to King Agrippa, he says to him, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. You see, King Agrippa clearly understood the title of Christian, okay, and refers to this title in a way that demonstrates the high status that is held by it in the eyes of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul confirms declaring, that it is his godly desire that all people believe and hold the title of Christian just as he does himself. You see that? The apostles know the very high honor of the title Christian. Okay, Sure, the world hates the title because those who bear the title are Christian are no longer of the world, right? They're no longer of the world, as Jesus said. And so, just as Jesus has taught his disciples, the world will hate you, even persecute you, because you follow him, right? But that just shows the heavenly honor of bearing this title, right? The world tries to shame this title of Christian, and there are even believers who for some reason are ashamed of the title themselves. But when we bear the title Christian, we are bearing the title of the Lord, the Christ, you see, Christ means the Messiah, you know, the one who was foretold all throughout history, the Son of God, who came to redeem all people who would believe. 
So when we bear the title Christian, we are declaring that we are of Christ. Therefore, we are of Jesus, right? Who is the Christ. And we are proud to bear a title with such a high honor. You know, this title is even a declaration that we are a new creature with a new life who are of Christ, right? And this new creature with this new life who bears the title of Jesus Christ, right? We bear his title. We are now as ambassadors of Christ, representing him in the world. And if we bear his title and represent him, then how much more must we conduct ourselves in the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ as his ambassadors to all the world? It's therefore shameful if we bear this title of honor but live in sin. It's shameful. If we are made new, right, in a heavenly calling with a heavenly citizenship, then we must behave like those whose country is heaven, right, the kingdom of God. Now, God's command, therefore, that we be holy as he is holy, right? His command here is no small thing, my friends. It is a big thing. Just as we are not inheriting a small thing, but we are inheriting a very big thing, right? Now, there are people who say, look, that's nonsense. We are not perfect. We are not God. We cannot be perfect. We cannot be holy in all our conduct. What's this you're saying? That's just an extreme view that's not realistic, they say, right? And by the way, that's the typical response of a lukewarm church that the Lord does not approve of, right? Now, let's see here. If God says to us, the ones that he created, he says to us that we are to be holy as he is holy, then we have to stop complaining and we have to do as he says. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we just discussed when Peter said that we must be as obedient as children in verse 14, right? Remember that? Not trying to think that we know everything, but instead doing, right? Doing what God commands of us. And what if Jesus tells us, by the way, what if Jesus tells us to be perfect? What would you think about that? How would the lukewarm church respond to that one? Oh, well, let's take a look. We can actually go and take a little field trip here to Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Jesus says, Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's right. That's correct. There you have it. Jesus says that we shall be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect. And by the way, he was not talking here just about our transformation at his return. No, if you go back and read the passage above, Jesus is talking about our current behavior and our actions with our neighbors in this life here. He is speaking about our life right now. We shall be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect. So, we have then that we shall be holy as God is holy, and we shall be perfect as God is perfect. What do you say about that? Shall we make excuses and start claiming that God must be wrong? In both, by the way, the Old Testament and the New Testament? Of course not. And actually, Peter confirms these things for us right here. Look, if our God commands it, then our job is to reach for it. Let me say it again. If God commands it, then our job is to reach for it, okay? And to do our best to be as perfect as we can and do our best to be as holy as we can, not setting limits as to how perfect or how holy we will reach, okay? We cannot say, oh, Uh, I will be a little less perfect today and a little less holy today, and it will be okay since I have Jesus to back me up. Well, good luck with that one. Not going to work. But if you wake up in the morning and say to yourself, today I am going to reach for holiness, and I am going to reach for perfection at the command of my God, and then leave 
everything else to the Lord who knows the intention and the integrity of your heart. Now, traditionally, people have said, it's okay, you know, if I make a mistake, I'll repent and Jesus will forgive me. But we should be aware that if you have this mindset, thinking that you have a get out of jail pass to use whenever you like, Jesus himself just might return at that time and catch you in your sin. You know, God never said, oh, relax and live a life casually and uh, he'll just clean up after our mess whenever we, you know, make a mess, right? No, that was never the case. God says, my people abide by my rules and keep themselves away from sin. God says, my people are to be holy as their Father in heaven is holy. My people are to be separate from the world and be perfect. My people are to put on the whole armor of God and resist the devil. And to those who live carelessly, he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Right? Which we read from the gospel. And I encourage you to watch, by the way, that seven-part series here on this channel called Iniquity, which is in the playlist. You would be surprised how much the Lord has to say about this very thing. But make no mistake about it, God knows whether or not it is in your heart to be holy and perfect for Him. If it is in your heart to be holy and perfect, it means that you have holy intentions and have perfect intentions. You see, Jesus said, it's not what enters a man that defiles him, but what comes out of a man that defiles him, indicating that it is the very thing that is in the heart out of which comes evil things, out of the heart of a man. And so how much more should we set our hearts then to do what is holy and perfect, to honor God, of whom by the way, whom, by the way we bear this title, right? Have holy intentions in all of our conduct and have perfect intentions in all of our conduct, right? Holy and perfect. And that is a great place to start because Jesus is the Lord of our hearts. And finally, recall that we have the Holy Spirit when we are born again. And this means that we receive that supernatural, out-of-this-world power, power of God that is within us when we are born again in the Spirit, which helps us to reach these goals that we otherwise often could not have reached on our own. Understand that point. This is true. And we already many times reviewed verses about the flesh warring against the Spirit and the Spirit warring back against the flesh so that we don't automatically follow the lusts of the flesh that we desire, right? So those who say, it is impossible for us to be fully perfect or to be fully holy, then you must not have the Holy Spirit. Because without the Holy Spirit in us, certainly we are a big mess, yes, but with the Holy Spirit, we are a new creation and we are able to live with fully perfect and holy intentions in our hearts. Because that's where the Lord's looking. And finally, let's just point something out. There is really no more time. You see, there's no more time, my friends, to say I can make a mistake and depend on having time to repent from this sin or that sin. No, my friends, there's no more time. So we are not even going to go down that road. Peter is making a very clear statement here. Conduct yourselves as obedient children while you wait on the Lord Jesus Christ to return and appear to us in the clouds. Right? That is the bottom line. There is no more time. And from here on, you and I are just waiting and watching closely for his return. My friends, do not dabble in sin. Peter implies that you are now accountable for all of your actions from this point on while we are waiting for the Lord to return. Do not disqualify yourself from this amazing inheritance that we are about to receive, right? Now, to conclude, it's important to see the pattern of thought by which Peter has taken us so far in his epistle. He has encouraged us, reminding us of this living hope that we have, 
right? This inheritance, which is specifically that Jesus Christ is coming back to receive us and that he will lift us up and change us in a twinkling of an eye that we may have new incorruptible bodies that can live forever in his presence and have eternal life in his kingdom. Then Peter taught us that it is this very thing, this very hope, right? This very living hope in the Lord's return that we should occupy our minds with at all times in order to be strengthened, especially in the face of trials and persecutions. And then Peter draws a kind of line here at verse 14 and 15, showing us that the responsibility is on us. Though he encourages us, we have to independently be responsible for our own behaviors, being obedient to God so that we don't disqualify ourselves from that great and awesome gift that Jesus is returning with to give us, right? So we shouldn't be fooled, my friends. Lift your Bible, right? Lift up your Bibles and read and be encouraged. Because you know what? Yeah, Peter and Paul and John and all the apostles, they're all right. They're all correct. We have a great gift in Jesus Christ. And we have absolutely zero reason Okay, no reason at all to be deceived when we read the Bible and follow all that is written in it. Always living each day, remembering that our Lord Jesus Christ is returning and imminently. And everything else is a small thing by comparison. Everything else is small by comparison. And if God permits that I suffer in this world for a time, I will hang tightly onto the fact that he is coming back for me. You know, there are many people buried in the rubble under that recent earthquake, 48 hours later, with absolutely no hope left that anyone will come and find them. If they have rejected Jesus Christ, how dark and cold a life, and even death, that it is. But for those who are looking to Jesus Christ, knowing that no matter what, Jesus will come back for them, even if they die, Jesus will raise them up and transform their bodies and give them eternal life and eternal joy and eternal happiness. My friends, these are the days when believing in the truth matters so much. It does. And I pray that you believe in it, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and aim to be holy and perfect in all your intentions and in all your conduct, in everything that you do while we wait for Jesus. The one and only, the one and only name that matters. Wishing you all a very blessed week. Till the next one.